On today's episode of the Cryptoverse, I would like to give you an update on my Kryptons. I would like to talk to you about the Mines social media token on Ethereum. I'd like to talk to you about the decentralized exchange from Coinbase, which is called Paradex. And we'll do some technical analysis on the market leaders. Shout out to Nick from Datadash for that line. So let's begin with the update with my Kryptons. So I've been playing around with this Ethereum-based collectibles game, um, and I found it via an ad banner on CoinMarketCap.com, and I've been experimenting with it with a kind of a fun way to fund the channel. That's kind of a tongue twister, a fun way to fund the channel. So some people don't like donating directly because they kind of feel like they're paying for content that they've already received, and that just doesn't compute in their mind, and they can't accept it. So this way, you're effectively donating some money, but getting something for it, A, and B, something you may very well may turn a profit on. So to me, it's a win-win, and I, I'm kind of having fun with it as well. Anyway, in the early hours of this morning, my James Comey character was bought by a user called Wally for 0 0.0851F. So thank you very much, Wally, for that. I do still have an Alex Jones here and an Elizabeth Stark, Alex Jones being the founder of InfoWars, and Elizabeth Stark being the co-founder of Lightning Labs. So I now need to buy another one because I I always want to have three in stock for you guys because when, when I was buying one at a time, I kept getting complaints that they were selling out too quickly. So unfortunately, all the other characters I had lined up in my bookmarks to buy and replace you know, the one that got sold, they've already gone outside my price range. So that's the bad news. The good news is that the method I'm using to identify characters with high future value is working. So I'm talking about like, uh, I had the the Winklevoss twins, Tim Draper, Edward Snowden, uh, Warren Buffett, these kinds of people. Those were the ones I, I had lined up in secret to buy, but they've already been traded up to, you know, prices that, that are sort of outside of the range that I think is, uh, is profitable. Anyway, that's the end of that. So <clears throat> I'll put, uh, well, you can just search for these characters on mycrypton.com anyway if you want to donate to the show and and buy them off me moving on to the next story then blockchain social network minds is integrating ethereum um, token for social media incentives and so on i talked about this the other day i've been using minds.com for um, a year or two because i was just thinking sooner or later cryptocurrency content creators are going to get censored so i best distribute my content across even these small social networks, Minds only has like a million users, and it's really a pain in the bum to, you know, distribute to another site that's relatively small. It doesn't seem worth it in the in the short term to, you know, spend the extra time, you know, distributing it to Minds. However, long term, the day when you know your Facebook account gets shut down, you go, ah, that's why I was building up a catalog and a following on Minds. And even now, I've only got like 100 followers on Mines, yet I'm continuing to post on there. Now, for me, Mines has exactly the same vulnerability as Gab.ai. And that is, like we discussed the other day, they can be attacked and censored at the level of their technical infrastructure. So you can always be attacked in the physical world if you have a centralized location. By contrast, and I always harp on about this, if you host the content on the Steam blockchain, it doesn't have that same vulnerability because it's the content is distributed across all of the witnesses on the Steam network. However, the main problem with Steam, it has a different problem, is that the incentive model and the rewards pool is and has always been under a gross abuse. And that's been happening for some time now. So it's not perfect by a long shot. However, Steam is superior in terms of censorship resistance, right? The incentive model, that's a, that's a separate issue. But if Mines is going for censorship resistance, then centrally hosting it is uh, still going to have that problem. They might help themselves by having a, a token of value that can be moved off the platform, which you can do, right? Like, well, how many tokens have I got? I don't know, like 20 odd tokens. And you earn them by having you know having people subscribe and having people like your content and all that sort of stuff and then i can then spend those tokens 
to boost content or run ads and all this sort of stuff. So uh, here in my wallet, I've got 20, 20 mines tokens. And uh, you can see all the rewards pool. And here's, here's, the, here's the price, the, the pricing menu. Uh, one token for a vote or two for a comment, four for a subscriber, you know, four for a retweet. If you introduce someone to the platform, that's 10. Just for logging in, you get two, which is interesting. And then if you do an on-chain transaction on the Ethereum network, it's 10, whatever. So I'm going to continue to play with this and I might run some ads. One other problem with this is, look, check this out. If I go to the news feed, you see here it says boosted. So this is someone has paid some tokens to get um, their content in front of people that haven't subscribed to their channel. This is the problem with it, look. It changes minute by minute and the length of the post is different. So say I'm down here, right? looking at my newsfeed and so on. Well, the the size of this content is going to change minute to minute. Now, actually, it might turn itself off if you're not looking at it. But if I look here, let's see if it does it again. Uh, depending on, yeah, there we go. <laughs> so it's um, the size of the ads constantly changing. So I'm assuming it's going to push down the content and it's going to jump around in your view. So and the, the length of time it stays there for is relatively small. Having said that, this piece of content has had 10,000 views. So maybe it works. I don't know. I'll have to experiment with it. Enough of that, though. I've made my points about that. Let's move on to talking about Paradex, which is Coinbase's decentralized exchange. The reason I want to talk about this is because Crypto Globe this morning posted this article called Paradex. Coinbase's decentralized exchange has been updated. New features are uh, support for things like the Binance token, you know, Civic, uh, HT, not sure what that is, um, KNC, Mana, Storage, and USDT. I talked about Paradex a little while ago. It's um, I'd give it a brief mention on the show. And um, I, I don't really use this yet, because if you look at it, it's Paradex.io. This is the decentralized exchange operated by Coinbase, and it's an Ethereum job by the looks of things. Most of these tokens are Ethereum-based. At the moment, though, it's not really viable, because look at the volume column. There's hardly any volume at all. The There's a coin with some volume. The Maker token, uh, 58 coins have been traded in the last 24 hours. And the only other token that has any volume is Ethereum trading against the DAI token. So DAI is the stable coin that's stable at $1. So 1,235 of them have been traded in the last 24 hours, which is pretty poor. In terms of the concept, though, as it says in the headline here, trade tokens directly from your wallet, i.e. your MetaMask wallet, or your ledger actually is compatible with this as well, your ledger hardware wallet. So no trading fees, no custodianship, no account signups and no compromises. So all, all Paradex is doing is keeping, is, is having a way if you to post your intention to buy or sell a certain thing, um, as a, you know, you put that in the smart contract and then when you find a matched buyer, the tokens go from my ledger to your ledger, whoosh, straight across and Bob's your uncle. So that's, that's the beauty of decentralized exchanges, right? And having Coinbase behind it, yeah, pretty cool. But right now, there's a lot of work to do. They're not anywhere near the leaders in decentralized exchange, so we'll have to um, let them get back to work on that. But let's keep an eye on Paradex. Could be could be a future winner. They're, they're expanding the coins, the coins they support, but without volume, doesn't really matter, does it? Right, that's enough of that story. Um, well, one final note on that, actually. Because there's no volume, and this... This paradox doesn't even show up on coin market cap. If you go to the search box, which now lets you search for, if I put in BIN, I can see Binance coin, but also I can see Binance the exchange. Whereas if you put in para, paradex the exchange is not on there. So coin market cap doesn't even re recognize paradex as an exchange. So definitely some work to be done there. Now let's move on to the markets. Let's begin with uh, Ethereum. Here's the old Ethereum. Now Ethereum against BTC, on Binance, I I kind of cleaned this chart up and started again. I always leave my moving averages on there, and then optional, I turn on volume or not. This time I decided to look at <clears throat> where Ethereum is in its sort of free fall against the parabolic move from December to January. And that's the basis on which I've drawn my Fibonacci retracement levels, as you can see from uh, here, back on 7th of December all the way up to the all-time high, which was like 12 and a half million Satoshis. Right now we're trading at 4.4 million, and you can see if I if I zoom into this, we're holding 
at the 78.6% Fib level, which is about 4.4 you know, million Satoshis, give or take a couple of hundred thousand. That's interesting. It did dip below that yesterday. However, as support levels are, sometimes it's elasticated, so it's pulled it right back up again. So that's pretty good. The strongest Fibonacci uh, levels are typically the 38.2 and the 78.6. So this this is the this is a key level of support in terms of Fibonacci retracement levels. So I'd say few, <laughs> you know, like wipe the brow that it's actually stopped the bleeding here. I also tweeted this out yesterday to say Ethereum would pull back to its 78% Fibonacci level. So this is um, this is looking at good support. I'm not take, I'm not suggesting any action. However, looking at this price action, that might be a good position. I'm just talking from my point of view just for educational entertainment purposes, a good time to take a position, a long position. Granted, you know, you've got moving averages pointing down and so on. However, um, the first indicator here is that it might have found bottom, right? It could still drop below that, of course, because if this breaks decisively, it's going to fall a lot further, in my view, maybe to 2 million Satoshis. But for now, looking at the price action, 4.4 mil looks like a good stopping point. Now, Bitcoin is up a bit today. Bitcoin against the dollar. Um, you see these vertical lines there, my uh, cycles. We're almost nearing the potential end of this uh, short-term cycle. Bitcoin up today by about 3%, but consolidating over the last seven days, as you can see, sideways move, sideways move. The low from yesterday was 58.58. So it was almost um, hitting that 5,800 level from back in July. Oh, sorry, June, June 29th. But looking the most resilient, while, every, while all the altcoins were in free fall, Bitcoin was holding so strong. It was absolutely unbelievable. Uh, I just, I was gobsmacked yesterday by how strong Bitcoin was as everything else was bleeding out. Let's look at Bitcoin Cash next, actually. Bitcoin Cash against the Bitcoin. I've drawn a couple of lines on here that I noticed. Again, I've cleaned this up and redrawn what I can see. This massive high kind of gets in the way, so I have to kind of filter this out a bit. But this was this was the sort of medium term trend line on Bitcoin Cash against Bitcoin, which it broke on about the 16th of July quite decisively, and then has been in sort of a free fall since then. Has now established this this downtrend line, and continues to fall. And it, right now it's above yesterday's low slightly. If I go right in here, let's put the auto zoom on. You can see right now we're trading just above yesterday's low. Full disclosure, I actually sold some Bitcoin cash and converted it to Bitcoin yesterday. And that's due to the Bitmain risk, uh, the IPO situation. I uh, haven't got time to cover that today, but I'll I'll, uh, I'll cover it in a future video. Next, like, let's have a look at Stellar. Stellar uh, XLM BTC. If we look at the broader perspective on this, XLM BTC holding up surprisingly well, you know, forming a big old symmetrical triangle. Um, and you see like a, a flat 200 day moving average here, which is indicative of, um, you know, a consolidated price movement. There's there's wide ranging volatility, but there's no trend as you, there's no real trend at all. You know, here it, it, anywhere on this chart, really, there are these small rallies and dips. But in the main, it's almost like right bang in the middle of that right now. If I drew a, a, a channel with horizontal support and resistance lines would be right bang in the middle of that right now. So pretty, pretty strong uh, price action given the market conditions right now for, for Stellar and still no confirmation on that Facebook rumor and them integrating Stellar. That for me still purely remains a rumor. And I'm not saying that's got anything to do with the price action. I'm just saying that uh, I heard that rumor. You might have heard it as well, but nothing substantial yet. Like final coin, let's take a look at EOS, EOS against BTC. I've sorted these in alphabetical order in my trading view, so they're easier to find. EOS falling but pausing. That would be my broad uh, soundbite analysis for today. Heading for 50,000 Satoshis uh, if it continues to fall. And that would take us back to prices not seen since the 16th of May. And that would be a drop of about 80% from the all time high use the measuring tool to go from right up here, which is like 243,000 Satoshis, all the way down to 50,000. That would That's a 79.5% drop. And that would have happened over the period of, again, if we use the measuring tool, you can measure time as well as percentages. So that would have taken us 
roughly, I'm going to guess how long it's going to take to fall that far, 117 bars, so that's like four months. Four months to go down um, 79%. And when it went up, if I cancel that, when it did its parabolic move, it went up by 387% in about 42 days. So that's interesting, isn't it? That happened to Bitcoin as well when it went up to 20,000. The rally took like six weeks and now it's taken like nine, eight or nine months to gradually bleed back. Ordinarily, we say that it's the other way around. We say the bulls take the stairs and the bears jump out the window, meaning you would, you would much more likely expect the chart to be upside down. This kind of price action, this gradual, you know, um, price cyclicity in a trending direction, you would normally expect that to be in an upward direction. And then when there's a price going down, you'd expect it to go down hard and fast, right? So just going back to the Bitcoin chart, if we turned this upside down, it would look more like a Forex chart um, in the sense that this, all of this, it would almost have to reverse it from right to left. So this movement gradually going up, right, would be would be normal. And this parabolic move would, if you turned it upside down from 20K to 8K, that would be more like a six week crash, you know, which happens quickly. I personally would prefer that, wouldn't you? Like a ripping off a Band-Aid. I would much rather it has gone up over nine months right, to give us time to get our positions and take profit and all that sort of stuff, and then for it to crash over this over six weeks. Just get it over with, get the bear market over with in six weeks, and then resume a new bull market. As it is, it's the way around, six week parabolic move, then nine months of absolute agony. So that's my preference. Let me know what you prefer in the comments below. The problem with it happening over six weeks is that it just, it blinds us all, and that euphoria kicks in so fast that you just, you don't have time to um, to sort of reflect on your trading decisions and decide what to do because it all happens so fast. So there we jolly well go. Um, that is actually all I've got for you today. So if you like this episode, go ahead and hit that like button. And if you're new around here, get subscribed. If you thought this video was absolutely terrible, you can hit that button if you want. And if you'd like to know how I do all this fancy technical analysis stuff, and uh, then you can go to cryptoasset.school and you can download a case study of one of my trades which made me a 40% profit in three days and in that document is all the proof that you will need which shows you the, the inside of my trading account to prove I actually did take the trade and all the rest of it. If you ever want to follow me on Twitter it's at ChrisConeyInt and if you want to get notifications whenever I release a new episode go to Cryptoversity.com forward slash notifications and if you've got a bit more time then uh, why not check out yesterday's episode which is called Has the Crypto Bubble Finished Deflating When Bottom? Where I give you a methodology on how to analyze any given cryptocurrency and decide for yourself when it has hit the bottom. Other than that, I'll be back with the next episode of the Cryptoverse. So until then, it's me, Chris Coney saying, bye for now.